expand our imagination. Welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm Jan Crawford. It's Tuesday, so we're joined again by New York Times chief political correspondent Jeff Zeleny, the fantastic, uh, always um, terrific reporter for the New York Times. As you know, he's going to be here every week, sometimes here on the set like today, sometimes out on the road as he's out reporting on those key races in the critical midterm elections that are coming up in November. Welcome, Jeff. Jan, thank you. So why don't we start today? Um, with uh, the news of the day, which obviously is yesterday, your paper, the New York Times, uh, one in the UK and one in Germany, published uh, a series of stories about 90,000 pages of documents that were released on WikiLeaks, uh, the website. What kind of um, uh, pushback have you seen uh, directed at the Times, and what is your kind of sense of how this story is going to unfold? I think what it has done, uh, first and foremost, is sort of uh, reignited the uh, debate over the uh, the war strategy in Afghanistan. And sort of shockingly, we're almost in August, and there really has not been all that much discussion about the war since the president announced his uh, surge strategy uh, late last year. So it's going to reopen this uh, debate, and it's happening uh, this week, this afternoon, on Capitol Hill as the House votes on this war funding bill. Well, now we're going to be joined right now by Congressman Jim Marshall. Uh, Congressman Marshall, you're a member, obviously, of the House Armed Services Committee. Thanks uh, for being here with us. Sure. Did you hear what uh, Jeff and I uh, were just talking about the impact impact that the release of these documents might have uh, on the war effort. What's your sense of that? Well, I did hear what you were saying, and uh, I haven't read the documents, obviously. I've read all of the articles, including the New York Times articles. Well, I guess I haven't read the British and the, and the German articles, but the articles that have come up in, here in the United States. And, uh, you know, somebody like me who's been following this in great detail for years, uh, the, you know, nothing new is... Uh, uh, as apparently the product of uh, this revelation. And as far as the debate is concerned that Jeff was just mentioning, we are going to have a debate today, but that's something that's been scheduled for some time. It's not unique, and it's not something that's been prompted by uh, this disclosure. Now, certainly, uh, some, of the, some of the information that's been disclosed will be referenced in this debate. Uh, hopefully, uh, what's been disclosed isn't really going to change our strategy, our resolve, those sorts of things, but we'll just have to see. The Congressman, as you know, the uh, debate this afternoon is actually going to be cut short. Uh, your leaders and your party have scheduled only a brief debate on this. How big of a political issue is this going into the midterm elections? As you know, some members of the Democratic caucus are strongly um, opposed to this strategy. I think the main issue uh, this November is going to be the economy, health care, uh, cap and trade, issues like that. I don't think the main issue is going to be the effort in Afghanistan. People are very concerned about that. Uh, they think it's a tough go, and rightly so. Uh, but I think what they've done is put that on a back burner to the to the more domestic issues that are just you know daily in the press. And I don't think the debate today or the WikiLeak uh, materials or the coverage of the WikiLeak materials is going to change that very much uh, right away. Well, you know, one thing, uh, Congressman, when the story first came out. You know, there was this kind of initial, wow, this is like the Pentagon Papers, this is going to really change the discourse. But it sounds like you're saying, you know, no, you know, we, and I think a lot of people have said, uh, we knew all of this, this is really nothing new, it's more details, you know, there's gambling in the casino, you know, we're not surprised. Right. But, but you know, going beyond that, I mean, is it more damaging that this kind of stuff now has an outlet? Uh, is it the leak that concerns you the most? Uh, or is it just that it's going to kind of keep this issue now percolating with, are you expecting backlash from the left? You know, just like the McChrystal reporting, uh, I'm afraid what you'll see is a, a, a bit of a clampdown, a reluctance by the military to freely interact with the press. Same is true with regard to these kind of tactical reports that are floating around. It's going to be there probably will be an impact on exactly how the Army and our armed forces generally handle information like this. What you want to see at a tactical level is absolute free flow of information among the parties that need to have that information in order to make good decisions. And so to the extent that this slows that, it's not good. We need to rethink how we classify things. I think the American people, you know, look at the summaries of uh, the WikiLeaks and they kind of go, well, shoot, that sounds like stuff we've already heard. Why is it classified? Uh, and we're rethinking classification as, 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 as we speak, actually. But wait, so you're suggesting that much of this, unlike, say, Senator McCain, who was saying this is a grave threat to national security, you're saying that 
you know, what really is happening is that this should just be more publicly available? No, uh, I'm saying that we need to rethink how we go about classifying information. You know, the easiest thing to do with regard to information generated in a military operation or in other operations in the government that are uh, that are that are important to national security is to simply keep that information secret, and then uh, at 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 some point uh, the information becomes public, and the and the public wonders why we kept it secret. That's what I'm getting at here. I don't think, from what I've gathered from the reports, I haven't actually seen the 91 some odd thousand documents themselves. But from what I've gathered from the from the reports, there's no bombshell here. This isn't Abu Ghraib. It's not the Pentagon Papers. Uh, and it's the kind of information that has been getting out to the public. Uh, the WikiLeaks revelation, I guess, makes the public feel like there's some drama here that really I don't think the public should be feeling. And transparency is something that's very important to the military. We need to work on it. Uh, the, the public should not be surprised, basically, by anything I've read uh, that's come out of this WikiLeaks thing, except for the fact that there's been this big leak. All right. All right, Congressman, do you believe that uh, this uh, gives any information to answer the question, is the United States winning the war in Afghanistan? I don't think this uh, affects that one way or the other. Uh, it's all, again, the summaries that I have seen, all of this information is information that was already out there, already public, people knew it. In weighing uh, the effort in Afghanistan, this information was already on the table. And so I don't think it's going to have that kind of impact. I think this will pass. It is a grave problem that classified information is leaked. Uh, individuals within the government having access to classified information are not free to decide whether or not revelation of this information will be harmful or not. I, I think we need to track down whoever did this. We need to prosecute them, put them in jail for a very long time, just as an example to others, uh, that you're not free to release this stuff. But on balance, given the reports we've seen so far, I don't think a great deal of harm has been done by this release. Not to say that it wasn't absolutely wrong and there shouldn't be jail time. I'm just saying, fortunately, uh, at least based on the summaries I've seen so far, this is not news. So uh, if I could just ask you one final question, Congressman. You, you don't think the White House, uh, it sounds to me, should be trying to stop uh, the additional release of, say, another 15 or 20,000 pages of documents? The, no. I, well. Uh, <laughs> Yes, they should be trying to stop the release of the additional 15,000 pages of documents. I haven't seen those documents, just like I haven't seen the others, but obviously they've been held back because people are concerned that there may be sensitive information being released that could be harmful to individuals, to the effort, etc. And I don't think it's a good idea that that be released. I think that should be withheld, and I think it's absolutely appropriate for the White House to try and and, and keep it from, from being uh, released. But what do you think the White House should do? I mean, if it doesn't, you know, it, it can argue it, but then what if, if the publications say we're going to go for it anyway? How far should the White House take that? Well, I don't, I, don't, I don't know whether the White House knows what this is. But if the White House has legal basis to do so, it ought to seek an injunction to ban the release. And I don't know what the legal basis would be. Uh, but it ought to move forward with, uh, with, with what tools it has legally available to it to keep these additional documents from being released. That's not a decision that should be me being made by the press, certainly shouldn't be being made by individuals uh, who have access to confidential information. Those individuals who release confidential information should be prosecuted, should be put in jail for an awfully long time, and the White House should do what it can, the military should do what it can within uh, the bounds of the law to try and keep this stuff from going public. It's been classified. Eventually it will be unclassified and available, but not now. All right. Well, Congressman, thank you so much for sure. joining us. We really appreciate it. Sure. Jeff, um, it sounds like, I mean, I, I thought his last comments on whether or not the administration wants to really go to war with some releasing these additional documents, that's just going to keep this story, uh, you know, on the front burner and on the front burner when they want to talk about anything other than Afghanistan. No question. And again, it gets to the root uh, uh, cause of concern here that a lot of voters and some liberal Democrats and some fiscal conservatives uh, are both uh, sh share one concern here about that this war has been too expensive and is it being fought in the right place now. So we can have the debate over the leaks and things, but this is going to sort of um, uh, bring to the fore another debate about the strategy. Is it right or wrong? And that's something that will uh, be going forward for the next three months. Well, we're going to switch gears a little bit now um, and bring in Stephanie Condon, bloggers from the left and right. Uh, flocked to Las Vegas this past weekend uh, for more than just a good time. 
uh, in the Sin City. Um, it was the Net Roots and right online conferences, both in town, both arm to arm uh, with the tools, knowledge to impact November's uh, midterm elections with new media. So, Stephanie, you were there having fun in Las Vegas. That's right, but Jen. working very hard, of course. Yes, of course. Um, what did you, I mean, I mean what uh, kind of was the, the, the most uh, striking thing that you uh, left uh, after kind of being at these conferences? Well, you know, the conference, uh, Networks Nation was uh, kind of the bigger event there. Um, it's in its fifth year, the largest, uh, the year's largest gathering of uh, liberal activists and bloggers. And it actually was in its biggest, uh, it had its biggest attendance this year, which is kind of surprising given the, uh, you know, lack of enthusiasm among Democratic voters and the um, acute disappointment among the base, the base. especially. Yeah. Um, and that was really on display at Netroots. Uh, there was a clear divide, even in the same uh, presentations, you'd have speakers giving kind of, you know, opposite messages about whether they should be supporting the Democrats or whether they could, you know, abandon them at this point ahead of the midterms because they've let them down. And uh, so well, that what was, did they do? I mean, that's a, the question, Jeff, uh, I think when we were talking about what impact this might have, uh, even with Afghanistan, mm -hmm. uh, on the on the left, I mean, in the base, where do, where do they go? They just stay home? I mean, what is their, what's the alternative? That's a good question. And um, I, I think their answer seems to be to push for better candidates. They're willing, as we saw in Arkansas, for instance, to primary Democrats that they don't think are meeting their expectations. And uh, they're quite all right with a smaller Democratic Party in power or even in the minority if it means that the party is, um, you know, adhering to the values that they see the party should be standing for. And, you know, so they're willing to go scorched earth route. And, and if it means, you know, bringing the Democratic Party down to a core base, that's all right with them. Well, it's, Jeff, it's, it's yeah. interesting that there was no one from the White House at this net roots a nation convention. What was the mood among people or the, or the feeling toward the president? Do they feel um, uh, favorable to him? Are they mm -hmm. sort of um, angry at him? Well, it's interesting, Jeff. Actually, first of all, one point that I thought was kind of amusing was there was one member from the administration there, Ray LaHood, who's one of their one Republicans in the cabinet. Oh, so oh, the, the head of DOT. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, it's just, it seemed kind of funny that the one person they'd sent to the liberal conference was the one Republican, but it also shows, you know, what they're looking for. They're, they're looking for people who can stand up for what they consider to be uh, progressive values and the stimulus, of course, which has uh, been a big part, um, which the tr transportation department has really, uh, uh, pushed um, as a big plus in their uh, um, in their minds, and uh, I think they're disappointed with the White House, and um, I don't I don't think they're ready to give up on him just yet. But um, it was very clear that there's a lot of kind of resentment simmering there. All right. Well, Stephanie, thanks very much. Oh wait, but first, what about the right? Um, well, Kelly, we've got to be you know. That's right. Balanced you know, here. Exactly. <laughs> uh, their conference was smaller, um, but very charged up. I think it all actually was kind of the perfect um, example of the Nevada race there, the Senate race. Uh, Sharon Angle, their candidate, uh, has probably a, a smaller uh, constituency that she really speaks to, but they're very passionate, and that's kind of what Right Online was about. And one point that was interesting there was um, how they were really pushing for Republicans uh, to continue their, you know, um, obstructionist uh, tactics against Democrats, uh, one point that continuously came up was cap and trade. And even though Democrats say they're not pushing for cap and trade anymore, they said we can't keep, we can't trust Democrats to keep it out of the legislation. So regardless of whether it's in there right now, you should always vote against the Democrats. So more unity you saw there than it. Um, yeah, the, they were a lot, they had a more cohesive message and seemed more fired up. Okay, that's really interesting. All right, well, thanks, Stephanie, for joining us. And uh, we'll look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks. Um, we're going to move on to the other big story uh, that captivated most of Washington last week, and that, of course, was the case of Shirley Sherrod, uh, the USDA official who supposedly made uh, racist comments uh, during a speech that got posted online. Uh, the administration saw that and 
Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack promptly fired her. Uh, the problem was that was not her entire speech. Her remarks were taken out of context, and she didn't say anything racist at all. So the administration scrambled to do damage control for much of, uh, what, a better part of, of two days. So, Jeff. We now hear, uh, and one of our colleagues in Atlanta, uh, Daniel Steinberger, has spoke with Shirley Sherrod this morning because the administration has offered her a job. They're trying to, you know, apologize, and now they've offered her a job. And it is uh, titled the Di Deputy Director of the Office of Advocacy and Outreach at the USDA. But Ms. Sherrod uh, is not sure she wants to take this, and she sh told Daniel that uh, she's got a lot of questions, like, Who's the director of the department? Uh, how much money do they have to fund, that work that, to, to, to fund the work that needs to be done? And is there money appropriated for it? So, um, Shirley Sherrod, there's something fascinating to me about this. I mean, this is a woman who uh, feels outraged and indignant, and she's not really going to go away quietly. Is this a story that the administration is going to have to keep dealing with, too, or do you think they've already put it behind them? I think they're trying to put it behind them, but it sounds to me like she's asking many of the same questions that any of us would ask about a new job. I mean, there's, the administration is sort of trying to, you know, ram this new job down her throat, if you will, and so she'll shut up. get her to go yeah. away, but she's asking a lot of the same questions. I think we've largely moved beyond, you know, the initial uh, fallout of the story, but it highlights a central question of the of this White House uh, any time a, a racial matter comes up, it's a reactive instead of a proactive approach. So, um, you know, she spoke to the president last week. That's about as high as they can go on their side, but she's still holding firm and, and saying she's not so sure. So I'm not sure we've seen the end of her. I think I'll be fascinated to find out exactly um, what becomes of her. Perhaps she'll write a book. Um, we'll see. Well, you know, she was, she's been, obviously, I think, pretty media savvy. I mean, you know, she's very good at getting her message across. And, you know, you know more power to her. I mean, she, she felt wronged, and instead of, you know, being quiet and not saying anything, she defended herself. And obviously now she's weighing her options. But when you talk about the administration and being reactive, um, you know, this is obviously not the first time. I mean, you saw the president having to kind of scramble with his comments after Lynn Sweet, uh, our friend from the Chicago Sun-Times asked him that question about uh, the arrest of an African-American uh, Harvard professor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, then he had the beer summit. I mean, you know, why, it, why is this administration and this president, which came in, I think, as the first African-American, there was obviously so much hope uh, that, you know, things had changed. Why does uh, he kind of have such difficulty with these racial issues? I spoke to quite a few uh, black leaders and a few members of Congress last week, and I asked them that question. They basically um, sort of are, are concerned that this president does not have um, a diverse set of advisors around him. He largely has the same uh, uh, team around him that he had in the campaign, and generally and by they diverse, are, do you mean, are white okay, men. I was going to say, do you mean racially, ethnically? I mean racially. Gen okay. and, uh, there was no one uh, who sort of had alarm bells that went off when all this was going on at the time. So I think uh, one thing that uh, this will do, it probably will add to the diversity in terms of views and, um, and things that this president uh, um, has around him. I mean, I think he is more comfortable talking about a race than most people in the West Wing. You know? And they make the argument that you know, he can't be uh, giving speeches on race all the time and perhaps you know, the best time to... Um, talk about races after he leaves the White House. But um, um, I think it highlights to them, um, you know, he has an extra burden as the first black president, right. you know, to uh, do things in a slightly different way. Um, so there's a lot of uh, sort of soul searching and, uh, and, and examining what happened last week. Well, yeah, I mean, they just, they, they moved so quickly. Uh, they fired her so swiftly. I mean, it felt very much like, and I think a lot of uh, uh, kind of the reaction to this was it felt very much like they were so... Um, skittish about any allegations that this administration is, you know, going to do things that hurt white people. And that came, that's come on the hills of this Black Panther controversy, uh, you know, and allegations that there's a double standard on race in the Justice Department. So it's almost like they're, they're now in this kind of skittish, reactive damage control mode. And how do they get out of that? I'm not sure how they get out of that. I mean, the uh, media, of course, I think is is a somewhat to blame for this as well yeah. in terms of the reporting of this, in terms of, you know, should this have been a story at all in the first place? I mean, um, should it have been um, to, to the point 
uh, where the administration had to right. you know, was so a afraid that it was going to be on right. television. So right. um, um, I'm not sure how they get out of this. I mean, there's no question that a lot of voters across the country um, have questions about the the fairness and how this administration is treating people. So I think uh, you know we'll see more examples of this. It's part of our are growing, I think, as a country, and it's not always pretty. All right. Well, we're going to uh, end today's show, uh, speaking of unfairness and ugliness and not always pretty, with um, my outrage of the week, which I think you might share, actually. We're going to talk about college football, the Crimson Tide, and the outrage of agents. This is a disgrace. Um, Alabama, the my beloved Crimson Tide's star linebacker, I uh, took maybe uh, a, a trip down to Florida for a pool party in South Beach, which sounds like a lot of fun, and, uh, but it may have been on an agent's dime, which means that he may be ruled ineligible, uh, which would be a grave setback for the Tide. But Jeff, this is an issue that you've been beating on for the decade and a half, that it's about time that we just uh, drop the hypocrisy of the NCAA and let athletes you know, take a flight if they want to, take a job after school. The schools are making all the money uh, you know, why can't these poor kids just, you know, get a little, you know, a, a t a go into a pool party and you're going to sit out your right. entire senior right. year? There's no question about it. I mean, everyone profits uh, from wait, the... Wait, wait, wait. And I got to say, when I said Jeff has been talking about this for a year and a half, he, I mean, a decade and a half, you actually wrote an editorial on this when you're at the University of Nebraska. That's right. I'm uh, so you're a one of the world's leading. You're one of the world's leading exactly. experts. And then back in 1995, after uh, Nebraska won a national championship, uh, there was actually a bill in the Nebraska state legislature to uh, pay uh, college athletes so they would get a cost of living uh, stipend and a salary. Of course, that would have violated NCAA rules, but they were trying to make a point. Some members of the legislature were. And it's been happening in uh, this discussion is going on in college towns across the country. Why yes. do universities and why do these towns make so much money and athletes basically, you know, are are doing it for free. Of course, the other side of the argument is you know, their co compensation comes much later and they well, will no, get, but not um, always. get paid. But I think at, at the very least, the NCAA has to address this in a realistic way, at least of cost of living stipend or allow them to do some kind of thing. Right. Like I mean, this. maybe, you know, Darius shouldn't have gone to a pool party, but if his parent, if he needs to fly to his parents, you know, anniversary celebration, I mean, even that is prohibited under the rules. And my favorite quote, which we're going to end on, was, of course, by the great Nick Saban, uh, the fantastic coach of the Crimson Tide, who says of agents, how are they better than a pimp? I think that really says it all. Sums it up. All right. We'll see you next Tuesday, Jeff. Thanks for being here. Thank you. And thank you for watching Washington Unplugged. Join us every day right here on CBSNews.com. And like I said, every Tuesday with our friend Jeff Zeleny. I'm Jan Crawford. Have a great day.